All right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody, back to another week of the Embracing Organics channel. I'm your host, Dirtman Dan, and joining us this week is our special guest, Tyler from Grassroots Fabric Pots. What's going on, Tyler? How are you this week? Doing great, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. Sorry it's been so long. Oh, it's, you know, it's kind of my fault. You know, we should uh, extend the in invite more often, but you're a busy guy, man. So uh, what have you been up to recently? I uh, just got back from uh, the Lift Expo in uh, Vancouver, which you guys were talking about a little while ago. And yes, they were handing out all kinds of awesome good stuff. Um, but yeah, made it through over there to Canada. And those are some amazing people, man. Uh, Canada is awesome. It's like, a, it's just like, I look at it like soil. It's like the more diverse your microbes are, the happier everybody is and the better things get along. And like Canada is like the biggest melting pot, mixing pot of cultures I've ever seen. So definitely get a chance, go to Canada for sure. Um, so yeah, Canada, um, before that, it was crazy. We had the Emerald Cup and we had the MJ BizCon. Um, we released our new uh, concentrated biology soil inoculant product and microbe foods. Um, so it's been it's been a little crazy, man, but we're having fun. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, being too busy is a really good problem to have, I would say. It is. It's been fun. We got a lot of cool stuff coming out and a lot of information, a lot of knowledge going on right now. Cool, cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll dive into that in a, in a little while here. So uh, we'll say hi to everybody else on the panel this week. What's going on, Mr. Tanasi Gardens? How you doing this week? Doing great, man. And yourself? Ah, no complaints here, man, because, you know, nobody listens anyway. <laughs> right. We could use more snow here in Denver, man. I was just talking to Landon Ayers. There's a lot of snow going on up in the mountains, but there's no snow in Denver. But uh, other than that, man, we're doing good over here. It's about time. We're a little late, bro. But Dab time. time, bro. Hell yeah! If you guys got something to smoke, get it out. Let's let's rip on something. So, uh, moving on down the line, since uh, since he's sitting there playing, what's going on, Mister Zen Premium Cannabis? How you doing this week? What 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 what's going on, everyone? Good to see you. We got some uh, some fire oil here. This is unnamed mixed strain BS. It's not going to focus, but you can see it's pretty clear. Very good stuff. I like it a lot. And it is almost gone, so it's a little bit sad. Uh, we're going to be smoking on that today. Um, mixed strain. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm good. All right. Moving on down the line. Uh, Mr. Fumador, how are you doing this week? Uh, doing all right. Uh, apparently, I got my uh, first copyright strike of the year yesterday on my YouTube channel. I've been a, a bad boy. Actually, I was just listening to the radio on my freaking stream, but whatever. Congratulations. Uh, Welcome that, to the club, uh, man. Exactly, right? I feel like a like a total uh, gangster stoner or something. Anyway, that's get a street cred is what it is. Yeah, totally. I got to get like uh, strikes or teardrops or something. We'll get We'll figure it out. You got to get a, uh, a copyright C with up, a line through it. Up, upside down notes with like a cut through it. Something. We got to figure it out, man, because I'm, I'm, I'm hard. I'm hard now. Yeah, anyway, uh, copyright striker. Anyway, uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, Grassroots Fabric Pots today. Uh, I'm quite fond of their pot. I only have a couple of them, but they're. I'm really fond of the whole fabric pot idea. Uh, I've uh, been curious about how it's going to evolve in the future, and I know he's uh, deep into it. So I'm really excited for a good show. So cheers, guys. All right. So uh, our God voice of the evening, Mr. Stony Scholar. What's going on, uh -oh. Mr. Stoney? It's going to be all dicks now. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the resident dick master is in attendance. Well, I don't know about that. Well, I mean, a if it's got to do, if there's any jokes. Let's not go too far. That are phallic in nature. I'm probably going to be the perpetrator of said bad joke. That's true. So, just got to own up to it. Well. You're here for comic relief, man. That's that's why we keep you around. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, no, just keeping busy. I mean, got got lots of irons in the fire as usual. So just uh, just trying to keep after everything and uh, getting high at the same time. So that's good. Hell yeah! Speaking of uh, getting high and keeping after things. We'll uh we'll wait till Mr. Cam from Land and Air is done with his bong rip and we'll say hello to him. What's going on, Cam? How you doing this week? 
I'm great, brother. How are you? Uh, no complaints, man. Anything new and exciting over there with you? Um, just uh, getting ready to, uh, you know, start seeing if the STS that I made is going to work and see if the crippy that I'm reversing is going to start reversing. It's uh, 16 days into flower now. Um, I've been spraying it for 21 days total so far. And uh, it definitely looks like it's starting to have some male formations happening like early on, like signs along with pistols. So that's cool. Um, I've never done it with Crippy before. And the recipe that I used this time is a different one than I used last time. So everything's new. So it's a completely new learning experience for me, but hopefully it happens, man. And we get to go through a bunch of S ones and then hopefully do it again. And uh, you know, release it to the public sounds cool man sounds cool that's what I we're like up to. It. i'm a i'm a big fan of your crippy that's uh some really fire stuff you got there thanks buddy all right so uh you guys say we get into the topic tonight all right so tonight's topic is getting the proper grow pot for you know, where you're at in your grow, maybe, you know, where you plan on finishing at. Basically, we're talking about just proper potting size in general. And I personally run grassroots fabric pots. I know uh, a couple other guys on here said they also run them. And I figured what a great opportunity to have our friend Tyler on. And I would assume he's got a, a slight bit of knowledge in, you know, potting and stuff like that. I hope so. I got a little got a little bit going on, but I can tend to go off in little crazy directions. So don't be afraid to Well, you know, you're you're quite stop welcome stop here it. then if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I figured so. No, I I hope you guys can be as natural as possible on this and rip rip whatever jokes you want. That's awesome, man. So I'm all for you guys uh, being yourselves there. Um but yeah, I mean, I I feel like I see like everything and I even have like the guys crazy guys calling me about the sips containers and um we've kind of tried to satisfy some of the living soil pots a little bit smaller now we're going to do them one gallon all the way up through all the different sizes so that's just coming out in the next week or so here um but yeah like just to run through some basic things real quick if you got a four by four tent you know i suggest a three by three raised bed not a four by four raised bed for more airflow um, in that four by four tent, if you don't want to do a raised bed and you want to work up a little bit, maybe you should try out, uh, some 15 gallon living soil pots just to get used to soil and, you know, feeding the soil compared to feeding, uh, the plant in a certain sense. Um, obviously I do suggest, you know, getting as the highest quality soil that you can get, you know, definitely I'm a huge proponent of soil testing. Um, personally in my own crops, I do, uh, Logan Labs saturated paste test where I send in my water and my soil together um, and they give me a report back of the available nutrients. So that told me what the plant took out so I can re-amend just what it needs. Um, and I find that my own process to be the most successful and allows me to reuse my soil. Um, I've but yeah. actually been uh, considering doing that to not only the the mini bed that you know you guys built for me here but actually on my veggie garden out back because that's completely untouched you know mm -hmm. uh the the garden out back is brand new this year and it looks like it's never been grown on before so i was actually really uh curious on getting a logan labs test done once uh springtime came around cool cool and it's really easy to do you know you want to go out there and Obviously, with gloves, you don't want to use any sort of metal or anything like that. You want to have a nice, clean bucket. Go out there and pull from pull samples from as many different locations as you can. Mix it together in a bucket, you know, and take two samples, put it in a Ziploc bag, and mail it out to them. Um, but the point of doing the saturated paste test is also sending in your water because we want them to combine the water and the soil together so they can recreate your situation as much as possible. And at that point they can measure the available nutrients that's left in your system. And then they can give you a report back of where that sits. Um, so that right there costs a total of, I believe $110 and they're in Ohio. So you have to factor in the shipping costs to Ohio and stuff like that too, depending on where you're at in the United States. 
Um, but at that point you get a soil test back and it looks like kind of like reading the matrix. It's really, um, it, it's not very easy to translate it. There's a few YouTube videos you can follow to try and translate your own thing. Um, but I've I know first- Tad Hussey from Kiss Organics. He did a, a podcast on it and I had to listen to that probably like four, maybe five times. And I still didn't absorb all the information that they were giving out. Yeah. And it's, and honestly, that podcast he did was probably the one you're talking about, episode 35 with uh, Aaron Crozier of Grow Roo or Pleat Group. Um, he's generally who we will send people to to get that test translated out. He charges $45 to give you a four page write up on your soil. So um, rather than trying to translate things or go through all these YouTube videos, um, in these situations, I think it's well worth it to pay him the extra money. Plus he'll give you, I think like 45 minutes to an hour on the phone just to talk to somebody who's very, very experienced and knowledgeable about soil. So that's a steal. If you ask me, man, for that small amount of money, somebody that has that amount of knowledge, that's willing to sit down and give you an hour of their time. That's a steal. That is definitely worth it. He's also the breeder of, I think, Wookiees or purple Wookiees. Um, he's actually, he's been very impactful in the industry in, in multiple different areas. So Aaron Crozier, Grow Roo. Um, if you look at him on Instagram, it's Grow Roo. Um, so G-R-O-W, then R-U. Um, he also has plant bricks as well. Um, there's a lot of people out there you can go to get that from, you know, cause sometimes Aaron could be busy because he gets a lot of people going to him. So you've also got people like Scott from Crescent Soil Services, um you've also got um i believe here in california there's a couple other different places that can translate those tests for you and i think logan labs you can even pay them to kind of translate that stuff for you um but you're going to find mainly that you're going to have mineral level imbalances uh they're going to need to be corrected um like in my soil every year i'm given grams of zinc copper a little bit of sulfur, um, some of those different items that need to be amended as far as mineral levels go. And then obviously nitrogen, um, you know, like soybean meal or kelp meal, I'm often amending every year with that kind of stuff to upload the system with some nitrogen. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, we can get a little bit back on track there. We got a little deep into the woods with uh, soil testing. <laughs> it's pretty normal on this show to get deep into the woods on a, a tangent. But we were giving out good information, man. I, I don't ever want to stop the train. Cool, cool. Um, but, yeah, getting back to different situations and different pots to use, um, I kind of reference like, what's the most popular thing that I sell? Um, and that's kind of changed a lot. You know, we've sold a lot of the 30-gallon living soil pots or 4 by 4 tents and 3 by 3 tents. There's a lot of people doing individual pots, running a blue mat system. Um, the blue mat systems are great. That's a ceramic carrot that has a column of water. Um, when that ceramic and the soil dries out, it has a plunger in it that automatically drops to water the plant and water the soil. When it resaturates, it reabsorbs into the ceramic and stops the water from watering. So um, that's a low pressure gravity fed system or a low pressure system. You just hook up a um, obviously a pressure reducer to to make that system work. Um, you do have to get your soil to the perfect saturation that you want first, and then you install the carrot in there and then adjust it to where it needs to be. And yeah, I would suggest- it's, it's not for trying to like wet new soil. It's for trying to maintain like the wetness that you already have. Yeah. That's where I messed up when I first tried the system, but obviously I'd reference you because you use the system on a daily basis. So that would obviously uh, be a good point to go to um, what's the biggest advantage of the b- b- blue mat with the fabric pots for example why would someone invest in that system as opposed to just hand watering normally because people normally used to uh, kind of a dry down cycle water dry water dry the blue mat i think is the idea being uh, to keep it essentially stable the entire time right yeah and that gets back to why we changed our pots so much to conform with this situation. Um, I do feel like you could probably run um, uh, the blue mat system in any style fabric pot and still see a great response because it's made, like you just said, to keep the water completely static. But the real reason why we've gotten to this point why the blue mats are so popular is because 
living soil growers don't want that dry down. Um, a lot of people feel that cannabis has to have this massive wet dry cycle. Um, I sometimes myself and seedlings will see the, the plants just immediately raging, you know, shooting straight up in the air before they get water because they're super dry. You know, they're just sucking up every little bit they get. Um, so I can get the wet dry cycle and the, the happiness of, uh, you know, seeing your plants raise up and raise the sky and stuff like that. But with living soil, we want to maintain the same moisture level so we can have a continuous cycle of nutrients to the plant. Um, there's several different microbes that will function, obviously, with your roots and trade the plant for food back and forth. They take sugar from the plant and then they give plant food. Um, I've recently just found out too, there's also a, a new kind of microorganism uh, or microbe that works with the plant and will actually enter the plant cell wall. Um, and then uh, the plant will absorb all of its nutrients and then it will exit the cell wall, um, which is pretty interesting as well. There's a really cool symbiotic relationship so it's got like a butler is what you're telling me <laughs> he basically comes in just dumps off a bunch of food and then he's like all right i'll be back later peace alfred you no know, um you really got to check out another podcast out there um advanced eco agriculture so advancing eco uh, yeah uh, several of our people are, are uh, tuned into it advancing eco uh Fuck, I can't think of the name. I, 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 advancing Eco Agriculture. Yes. The good thing so we're all stoners. Holy shit. That's, uh, John Kemp. He's yes. uh, a real, <laughs> uh, His recent podcast about how the microbes are, the plants are farming microbes just like we farm cattle in a certain sense. So that's See, like I always, I always kind of picture the rhizosphere as kind of like uh, an auction house. Or like a like a bidding zone, right? Like the plants sitting there, like I need nitrogen, I need nitrogen. First person to give me nitrogen gets this cookie. You know what I mean? And the first the first microbe that makes it over there with the nitrogen that he's looking for gets the protein that the plant's trying to give out. And then he's like, "All right, I need phosphorus. I need phosphorus. Who's got phosphorus?" And then the first person over there that gets the phosphor with the phosphorus gets the reward. You know what I mean? It's like a reward based system. And I always kind of viewed it as kind of like a like a you know, like a bidding war or something like that. Like first person, first person to the gate gets, uh, gets the cookie. Yeah. And I would have to say that the plant wants to give out as many awards as possible. And that is going to go on as much as physically possible. You know, like that, that competition happens 50,000 times a second in a healthy system. You know, um, I would have to say that that's how fast those things move. Um, but yeah, check out Advanced Eco Agriculture and they talk about the, the more symbiotic relationship that we're learning about microbes and it's really some awesome stuff there. Um, but the wet dry pattern and um, air pruning is really not all that great. I know that's kind of a shocker, but for obviously- Kind of the premise of the, the fabric pots, right? The idea is that it, it branches out. So why do you say it's not that great? So, well, in a living soil situation, now, let's say, now, another point I want to say is we do know there's plants and trees out there that survive just fine without soil. Okay. So let's go to that point. And that's why I was talking about those other orchids uh, and those air plants and all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff, the uh, d dust bunnies, the tumbleweeds and stuff. Those are alive. There's all kinds of plants that survive without dirt, right? Even in the mountains, you'll see a tree growing off of a rock. You know, yes, it's got roots hitting a soil way down in there. But the point is, is there's microbes that are fixating uh, nutrients for the plant that are right there within the root zone that are touching the rock because obviously they've got fungi there. Fungi is the only thing in the world that can eat a rock surface and translate that out into nutrients for a plant. So that's a, a huge point I want to make as far as like things survive just well without soil. Um, so there is that symbiotic relationship in between microbes and the plant. Um, but the important thing is, is a normal fabric. Pot Which, By the way, if I can interrupt you, we always talk about embracing more organics. Uh, a lot of times uh, synthetic growers think that their mediums are sterile. They think that they're bereft of all microbes. There's nothing living there. And they think, Oh no, bro, it's clean. 
there's actually quite a bit of microbes in there. And if you cultivate the right community, you'd probably be better off, right? I wonder, do you guys, I, I don't mean to, actually, I do mean to derail it. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> do you ever use um, the smart pots with synthetic growers to kind of uh, uh, bring some of our audience into this, this discussion? Because we get a lot of people who don't necessarily grow organic, but like to kind of tune in, you know? Definitely. And I would say that's where my normal fabric pots come in. And that's why, you know, our niche is living soil, but we're still selling about 30% normal fabric pots because they want an immediate dry down. Because once we can get that dry down, we can do another feeding. The faster we can get a feeding, a dry down, we can get another feeding in, another feeding, another watering. So it's, it's kind of like um, we do have a lot of customers that will use straight cocoa or cocoa and perlite, um, a lot of different mixtures and be feeding the plant a nutrient program and fertigating out. Um, and that does happen. And that's where I think the air pruning is important. And the normal fabric pot is, is the, what you need to be using because it's going to dry out. And here's the major difference in between this is it's going to dry out from six to eight different sides. It's going to dry out from the top down. It's going to dry the left, right. It's going to dry from the bottom up if you've got it, you know, lifted up off the ground on something. So that right there is an unnatural drying pattern. Oh, that was good timing there, Mr. Tanasi Gardens. Hey, I've been waiting to hit that fucking bell, man. Damn it, man. Let's go. Let's take a dab. But please, uh, you're saying it's an unnatural drying pattern as opposed to like a forest where it rains or whatever. How would the, no the normal drying pattern be? A normal drying pattern is why we made the living soil liner pots is because we wanted it to dry from the top down only, just like native soil. You go out into a field, the sun is going to dry the soil out from the top down only. So right. that's why the living soil pots are there is we're here to recreate native soil. Uh, speaking of your living soil pots, we had a question in chat. Uh, somebody was asking, what is the, the liner in the pots made out of? Uh, it's really cool. It's the same material as the fabric pots itself. It's just um, the normal fabric pot material is a non-woven geotextile. And this stuff is woven and it's woven so tight that there's no water that can pass through it or air. It's pretty much a tarp material. Okay. But I didn't know that. Polypropylene is what it's made out of because we can't make it out of hemp yet. All right. We have were going to ask you all about yeah. That, yeah have you explored materials that Materials and everything else. Yeah. Is that the future? If you guys can grow enough hemp and we can process it here in America to where I can buy seventy rolls every two weeks in the busy season, um, I'd love to launch a hemp line. The only thing that I've seen hemp so far was about forty percent hemp, and it fell apart in six weeks. So that's great for transplanting. So like ultimately I would love in the future for us all to be using these cool little hemp fiber pots um, and to be putting humic back into the soil because that's what you'd be doing because that thing would just immediately compost once it hits the soil and water. Um, so right now the hemp fabrics that we have are cut with other fabrics. Um, anything that we can find right now is a fabric supplier comes from China um, so there's some huge issues there. Um, you don't want that. No. It makes sense. It, 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 it also explains like why, you know, why something you might want and you might think, oh, it's just obvious. Just make this thing that I want out of this thing that would be super awesome. And then you have to realize, oh shit, it's going to break down in six months. It's going to be a super warranty claim. It's going to be this, that, and the other thing, or it's going to be too expensive to make or on and on and on and on. I or it's like cut that. with Chinese lead dog material or something. You know what I mean? It, it could be horrifying. It's funny. The breakdown thing for six months. I like that. Well, well, if we can get three months out of it, that'd be great. We're lucky to get six weeks out of what I've seen. And there were, five dollars for a half for a one gallon pot so i mean by no means is that commercially viable um i feel like know, that would be good for a seedling though if you're like maybe not for a farm or like acreage but like they do have those gallons. little like seed starter cups that break down they yeah. already have something like that oh but, yeah it's you know, that's the future of hemp though also because everything's just coming online hemp houses hemp. i think I think the main issue right now is the processing of the fiber. 
We don't have the technology right now to process it well enough here on the state side. That's what I've been told. There's people right. we've put, we've reached out. We were, I'm a part of several hemp fabric associations or hemp associations specifically for the fact of, you know, forever I've had that request. Why don't you make these things out of hemp? So, you know, I want to satisfy that at one point and, you know, we're, we're telling all these companies we'll buy 70 rolls every two weeks in the summer. So, um, I hope that's motivating. Okay. Yeah. I knew, uh, Tanasi and Fumador were both curious as to like, you know, what's the future of, uh, fabric pots and stuff like that, because right. me personally, I'm okay with using the, the polypropylene. Like, I don't, I don't feel as though it's that detrimental to my soil. And um, quite honestly, it cleans really easy. Like I had, uh, I had some issues where I had to dump the bed and I used like a bunch of OxyClean and a scrub brush and they cleaned up really easy. And then they went, I put it right back together and everything was fine. It's been chugging along ever since. Right. I highly, highly recommend growing in native soil or your own soil whenever you can. Um, and that's why I always get to educating people about, um, doing what they call an agriculture, um, on my space in it right now, um, a, uh, percolation test. So you dig a hole out there, um, you fill it with water, come back 24 hours, fill it with water again, and then time that drain down. Um, so in a yard, a backyard, a field, you should be doing that in a whole bunch of different spots and make sure you have great drainage everywhere. You're going to find areas mostly, especially in California, you'll have a little corner in the backyard that's got great, great soil and great drainage. You go to the right 20 feet and you've got a rock formation. <laughs> so, you know, I urge people to check that out. And I would say that's where fabric pots come in. That's why we're there is because we're the closest you can get to growing in native soil and not disturbing it for the longest period possible. So, you know, the sustainability side that we have is we try to find the highest quality fabric we can get. We put the highest quality stitching on it that we can, and we, we hope that it can dramatically outlast anybody's expectations uh, for the fact of hoping to keep it out of the landfill. Because, like, you want to talk about sustainability, like, I will freak out when you've got this indoor grower that's using his five or seven gallon fabric pots and tossing out the media and the pot every single time and the root ball which is just like so much beneficial stuff they're just throwing into the landfill, which is great for the landfill. Maybe they're helping the landfill compost faster, but you know, Hey, you're putting out a lot of, a lot of crap out there. So you're basically throwing money out the window at that point. Yeah. And I'd say that's the big difference in between living soil and synthetic growing is synthetic growing. You're going to water and feed that plant like a prisoner as much as possible. And it's going to drain out the drain and you're going to hope that plant's happy compared to living soil, we want to put this everything in the soil that needs to be there. We don't want to use bro science. We want to use science to know that we've got all the minerals properly there on the right levels. So the plant can actually treat the soil like a kitchen and get what it needs when it needs. And we're going to supplement that with foliar sprays. I am a huge proponent of foliar spray and foliar spraying and feeding the plant because in living soil situations, you have no dry down. You have that period where like, I want to feed this thing, but I can't give it water right now because then I'm going to risk too wet of situations for too long. I'm going to breed ciliates in my soil, which is going to breed mold. Then I'm going to get PM and russet mites. I mean, it's just, it's a rabbit hole that you go down really quickly. So that's why when you want to do something to your plant, you need to rely on beneficial foliar sprays to feed the plant in a healthy way not a pesticide way. A lot of people look at foliar spraying as like, I'm going to knock down the bugs. I'm going to smack them in the face with this water, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I foliar spree, foliar feed in veg. Let's cover that real quick. It's in veg, um, aloe vera, um, kelp, um, Pacific Grove fish hydrolysate. And I'll usually go in there with some uh, boron and some silica as well got to be real careful with those because they definitely change the pH is really fast and you have to make sure that whole time. Oh, uh, let me stop you. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, my internet's good. super shitty. I don't know if it's going to sound like laser beams or whatever, but uh, do, what kind of boron do you use? What do you use for boron? 
I would have, I would highly recommend, um, uh, I would say getting it from build a soil. They've got a pretty, pretty good option where you get a pound for like less than $30. Um, I've used maybe five teaspoons out of that pound in like the last eight months. So, I mean, you buy that, you could have that for a very long time. I mean, if you buy a 50 pound sack of boron, you'll never buy another sack ever again in your whole lifetime. Even if you're growing uh, unless you spill that's, it somewhere. I think that's the exact same thing as the Aptus booster or something, right? And the Aptus booster is like three, four hundred dollars a bottle or something. I'm fairly confident it's basically the same thing, just essentially liquefied yeah. boron in some way. That and they're so. they're selling you ninety nine point nine percent water. Water in a pl- well, a plastic jug too, of course. Oh, you gotta pay for that and you gotta pay for the marketing, you gotta pay for the travel and you know, all kinds of stuff. So um that's why I'd suggest the obviously like somebody like build a soil um if you're doing your uh soil testing and recommendations through somebody i would recommend also trying to buy that stuff through them um pairing that stuff together to get some discounts and everything Um, but foliar spraying for the the health of the plant is something you can do probably almost every 24 hours honestly um and that gets me into bricks readings um, and how, um, uh, we can be taking a bricks reading before we foliar spray the plant to see the sugar content in the plant, which is relative to the health of the plant foliar spray. And then 10 minutes after the foliar spray, an hour after the foliar spray, take that bricks reading again, take a leaf, squeeze it out, put it on the meter and see the health of the plant. You should see a constant rise in the health of the plant. So then that gets us into plant health. And yes, there is a meter that will tell us our plant health. Um, That meter goes from zero to 32. That is the same meter. It's called a refracto meter that's used in beer brewing. Um, It's also used in mainly the wine industry. They use this uh, to squeeze out the juice of the grape onto the meter so they can find out the sugar content. So they know it's in as high as possible to harvest the grape. So we're starting to use that in the cannabis industry to judge our plant health, judge what plants that we want to take clones from, prove our plant health, um, a lot of cool different things. And you should be using that on a daily basis. Um, there's Then it gets to the point of, okay, I've got positive or negative readings from this. What do I do with that and how do I calculate that? And that's the point where you need to get to a consultant like somebody like Roru or somebody who's doing plant sap uh, analysis and, and referencing there. So that's when we get really deep into stuff. Shit. They look uh, basically reflect refractometers. Sometimes tools scare people. I don't know. Sometimes people are massive tools, so it's not a big deal, but sometimes they're super scary. This isn't super scary. You can get them on Amazon for, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 bucks. It looks like it's super sophisticated, but it's basically just a, like a little telescope that you smear some leaf material on there and you kind of squish it around with the, you can, you can be as simple as you cut the stem, drip the leaf on there, squish it around with the leaf stem, squish this down and move it around. And you basically look through it into the light and you see a particular reading. And so you're saying like the number can go up, the number can go down depending on what you're doing. Super useful. It's super useful. Um, I think in the future, there's going to be facilities that are super scared of that because they sell clones and there's other facilities that are super proud of that because they'll be proving their plant health as their clones are going out the door or as you know, the cannabis they provide to people. Yeah. I've personally never used one. The most cool agriculture stuff, man. You guys are blowing me the fuck away. I don't even know what the fuck you just said, dude. <laughs> I'm with Nazi like, on this one. Yeah. Like, what the aliens, fuck? bro. It's aliens. <laughs> I talk really fast. You guys got to slow me down and ask questions. What? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is great. This is great information you're giving out here. Well, yeah. We should probably get back on the topic of like pot sizing, talking about proper pot sizing. What is the proper pot size, Dan? Well, About that's just ounce. that's just it. Is it depends on what are you trying to do? But like, if it's are really you going, nice, an eighth is okay. Like, <laughs> the <laughs> damn you, Fuby. But like, all right, perfect example. Are you going soilless or are you going with a living soil? 
you're going to need completely different pot sizes if you're doing one or the other. True. You can get away with a lot smaller of a pot size if you're doing soil, if you're doing an inert substance and you're going to be feeding, you know, every uh, every watering. Like Tyler was saying earlier, you want that to dry out so you can hit it again with nutrients. Um, Dan's not joking because uh, here's me being this like naive whatever and and uh, you know I go to this garden club every once a month uh, my buddy Cannabisi and look him up on uh, Instagram uh, anyway we're shooting a shit a couple of the growers are synthetic growers and me being the you know hot shot what are you on a podcast bro I can talk I was telling my friend oh you should totally uh, bump up to a seven gallon fabric pot for this cocoa and everyone just starts fucking laughing and I'm like well what we're all high of course at the time we start to get to talking the root ball on that seven gallon cocoa fed, you know, drip irrigation, whatever, advanced nutrients, whatever. It's going to be like freaking four pounds of root mass. That plant is going to be like, you know, it's going to be a monster. It's going to be for like a 10 foot uh, tent. So you can't always transfer technology, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like the root, the, the pot size, it matters. I couldn't take my seven or 10 or 20 gallon pots and use cocoa in them. It would be a complete disaster. Yeah, you would totally run out of space, or you would wind up not using you everything. Of nutrients, or the plants would rot because you'd pour so much water in there. Something it'd be terrible. Yeah, you you'd wind up you'd True. wind up either not using it all, and you know, uh, basically getting not as much plant as you could have gotten, or like you said, you you run into like root rot, you run into all types of issues. But like, if you were going to do a living soil, you want as big of a pot as you could stick in there without running into an issue. It's the complete. It's the complete opposite to where you know, like Fumi was just saying, most people would flower out with a five gallon if they're running cocoa. Um, flowering yeah. out in a five gallon of living soil is damn near impossible. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what's your advice, Tyler? Yeah, I guess you have um, two sides. I think it's figure out what the hell direction you want to go in and stick to it. <laughs> you know, if you want to go soilless and cocoa, then yeah, you need to grab onto a nutrient company and uh, ride that wave and follow their nutrient schedule and their regiment and, and do it the best you can because that's your prisoner and you're trying to make him as happy as possible. And you're telling mm-hmm. them to feed, eat, drink, sleep, water, you know, and you're expecting them to be happy, you know, good, you know, and I'm not trying to talk that down. It, I, there's people that are very successful with it. In fact, I was in LA a weekend ago visiting one of my best friends and they have one of the most amazing synthetic grows I've ever been to growing some amazing stuff like guava and purple wookies and, and some insane stuff. And, and they don't even care for living soil because it's just fine and the bills are getting paid. So they're in one gallon pots doing rock wool little things and they're feeding it uh feeding their plants once a day at a thousand ppms and well, they're rocking it out you know? our our one panelist who isn't here tonight uh jeff from the grow from your heart podcast he would be saying right now you know how hard it would be to scale up on a commercial level something like a living soil bed yeah like you well, know, that's it, why you do synthetic for a while. Mm-hmm. It, it's much <laughs> it's much easier to to scale up on synthetics than it is to to scale up on living soil. You really well, gotta you really gotta know what you're doing if you're going to be running living soil beds. I mean, is it or isn't it? I mean, it is in many ways. It isn't in many ways. I guess you have to have kind of like the, a paradigm. You have to have employees or workers or whatever that that kind of understand the paradigm, the technology that you're you're using. But for example, that metaphor of the prisoners. I've always thought of synthetic grows as more like. Uh, hospital patients on IV, but I mean, on some level, they are prisoners, you know, you're holding them captive. Ultimately, we are frankly holding them captive. They'd probably prefer to be out in the wild somewhere. And then you're basically force feeding them like a duck or like a goose that you're making fatty liver out of. You're basically shoving food down their throat. It's an interesting metaphor, as opposed to, for example, they're still being held captive, unfortunately, but my living soil girls or Dan's or Stabby's living soil girls are at least eating what they want to eat. Maybe it's cold comfort if they don't want to be there, but I'm assuming that they do. You know what I mean? It's cold outside. Yeah, like I, don't I, know, whatever. I don't I didn't exactly give them the biggest backyard here, but at least they have a yard right. to go play in. But the thing is, you can have a symbiotic relationship. And this is where it gets into Tanasi and his need of mushrooms. Because I have customers that are growing mushrooms, magic mushrooms, King Safari, and all these mushrooms right in these beds with their stuff. 
Um, so that is like a reason for doing it is like, we need to companion plant together. Um, Green Life Productions in Nevada, he's growing strawberries and carrots right with his cannabis in a, in a licensed facility in the state of Nevada. And he gives away food to his employees because he wants them to be healthier and he doesn't want them to get sick and he wants them to come to work to harvest his weed. So does that weed taste any different with the polyculture? Have you had, have you had a chance um, to experience it? Steve. Yes. Uh, Steve Cantwell. He's an ex UFC fighter in Nevada. His cannabis is actually usually bought out by the bud tenders before it can even hit the shelf. Hmm. So the popularity that green life productions has in Nevada um, I think they, they disperse their cannabis to 20 or 30 different dispensaries in Nevada, but it's, they follow his Instagram and they follow the drops and people are there asking for it. They're the only place that has a jar return program in Nevada where it's, you return 20 jars, we give you a free shirt. Um, you know, they're, they're a huge, they're as, as sustainable as they can be in the most unsustainable town. Mm-hmm. So that's, a, I think, a good way of putting it. So definitely check out Green Life Productions and Steve Cantwell and uh, uh, Scott from Crescent Soil Services are the reasons why we have the living soil containers. And I mean, so, some of the theories of polyculture are too. Go ahead, Tanasi. Go ahead, go ahead. Are you saying <laughs> I should just pour a bag of mycelium into my pots and then I'll have gourmet mushrooms pop up? You're seeing this for, for like pictures and stuff? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You need to check out Green Life Productions in Nevada. He's grown mushrooms in his beds. Um, And obviously that's the whole goal of doing a living soil system. And that's where you know you're hitting the right moisture levels and doing the right things is because our goal is to create a mycelium network in the system so the plants don't have to create as big of a root network. Because we all. I'd be curious to see what strains are popping up because the strains that I've known are not, they're no they're more beneficial to the plant as they get mulched in with that, as opposed to like, if you were to pick it, there's not going to be much benefit for you. Yeah. Even well, just you got to pick it. out my uh, personal Instagram, Tyler Sierra life. I posted a photo of some mushrooms that I had popping up in the middle of the last season. Um, mm-hmm. I have uh, our new product, the uh, concentrated biology. We have a fungal version of that tea and food to feed for chitin and calcium which brings fungal in the soil and eats anything chitin related. After using that, I immediately had these mushrooms pop up. Okay. Hmm. That's pretty okay. interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to try some yeah. experiments. Uh, we actually had a, a couple questions for Tyler from uh, people in chat. Um, Stabby McStabwood, who is also a panel member who's not here tonight, he wants to know uh, what's your thoughts on photosynthesis plus? He's giving himself a foliar spray tonight, a sulfur foliar spray. Um, well, usually if I'm going to foliar spray sulfur, I'm probably going to do that by itself or with I'm other joking, minerals. Actually. No, no. <laughs> that's, that's like not willing. He's, he like, would ah! rather not be. No, that, where Stabby <laughs> works, he's getting, a, he's getting himself sulfur foliar sprayed. Um, I think Photosynthesis Plus is a great product. They've gone through some amazing scientific, scientific work to get to where they're at. Um, So it's a great product. Um, And if you look and see what uh, the concentration levels are and what different species you have, I'm sure they're beneficial and I'm sure they're helpful. Um, And I think um, it's a great complement to any living soil system and it's going to really help photosynthesization. Um, And I would just say um, I have something that's a little bit better than that because I have something with 20,000 different species in it. So, you know, the different products that are out there have a handful of different species, but if we want to grow in a living soil system, we want diversity. Diversity is key. Um, We would want to use a product that has as much diversity in it as possible. You were uh, teasing that earlier. Uh, You have some kind of a new product you mentioned. Is it, is it some uh, foliar spray? Because we know that you're all about foliar. I love foliar spraying this stuff. This is where I mainly use it. Um, especially because I was helping a customer of mine and I brought home some russet mites because that does happen. So, um, I, yeah, thank you. Version. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful people we've got out there, but Hey, everybody needs help. Um, even me sometimes I well, definitely need them. in their defense, you know, if they didn't know they had them, 
they they can't warn you. Well, it was more of my fault because they did know they have them, and I didn't do a good enough job protecting myself. Um, in yeah, that fair enough, situation. fair enough. So it's it's totally my fault, and it's a great person, and we've brought him to where his grow now has no bugs, no infestations, and he's looking at pulling sixty pounds in a winter crop up on the hill. So um, we've turned that garden around, um, and that's a good thing. But yes, foliar spraying microbes is amazing. Uh, foliar spraying the right microbes is very important. Um, and it's amazing if we were to have a good enough microscope, which I've got a microscope that goes down to a thousand times. Uh, I think it's not even the proper microscope to really look and see the microorganisms that are alive on your leaf surface. You'd really be surprised at in even in 110 degree weather, what microorganisms can survive on the leaf surface to defend your plant against issues and diseases. So I, uh... I I watched a documentary before. They said something like they found microbes living on lava jets in the ocean, which are like 15,000 degrees or some crazy number like that. And they found microbes down there eating off the, the smoke that comes off of it. So, yeah, I've, 150 degrees is probably nothing to them. Well, and, and certain microbes will survive in certain areas. Certain There's a lot of other microbes there that are there that just aren't awake and they aren't alive in that situation. And that's what brings us to our products is I've got a product that's just for overall diversity to breed overall the best diversity we can breed. Um, so it's a microbial soil inoculant with 20,000 different microbes in it. And it started as a compost tea. And that's why there's so many different microbes in it. Um, it's an agricultural product and it's agriculturally priced, um, for a small grower, um, you would use six to 10 milliliters, um, in maybe one to five gallons of water, um, to activate those microbes, you put it into the water, but then you also feed it the microbe food that we provide you. Um, we have microbe food that feeds and activates our microbes but also feeds and activates native microbes and benefits and feeds them as well. Um, so that is an awesome system. Uh, the main one that we've came out with is what I just talked about, Metagrow ST. Um, that one is for overall diversity. Um, then we also have the other versions of it that we're going to be coming out with liquid later on down the road um, and food to go with that liquid. Um, right now we have the seafood which is chitin and calcium that we use to feed the liquid that we have the microbial inoculant that will feed the microbes to train them to eat nothing but chitin. So chitin is what all of these bugs are made out of. Chitin is what makes up the soft shell body of a russet mite, an aphid, um, a uh, caterpillar. Um, any fungal diseases you have in your soil, they're made out of chitin. Um, any fungal you have in your soil is also made out of chitin, by the way, too. In mycelium, it's made out of chitin. All those different things are made out of chitin. So let's say you have a situation where it gets out of hand and you have a problem, a fungal disease, fusarium, dry rot, um, any of those different damping off, or you have any of these different bug problems. We can take our microbes and feed them the calcium and chitin. So the microbes are used to eating nothing but calcium and chitin. They're just calcium and chitin soldiers going crazy at 1 billion microbes per drop. Um, you take that, you take 6 to 10 ounces of those microbes, put them in a bottle, foliar spray them onto your plant. When their calcium and chitin they've been given by us in the brewing process is gone, they're going to want to attack anything that's made out of chitin and calcium because that's their food source they've been trained to eat. So... Um, that obviously gets us into the weeds of how beneficial that can be for those situations. Well, all um, right. So like a, another good friend of the show is uh Frass Valley and, um, his yep. product is like 16% chitin. He, it says right on the package. So yeah. that would work in conjunction with helping exactly. break that back down and return it back into the soil system. But nobody ever on a soil test has ever recommend to add cups of frass to your soil. I think there's one huge thing that you guys really got to be careful with is the thing that really brought me to light was doing a soil test and what they recommend to put into my soil. 
why would I want to put anything else in there that, that I didn't, that wasn't recommended to me by a scientist that I need for my soil? Cause you can create tremendous off balances. You know, that's why we saw the big rift in the system here in the industry with neem and neem cake. Now, People really got in trouble. You call somebody, you want, oh, I want pounds of neem cake. How much do I use? They don't tell you how much to use. You don't find any <laughs> use rates for that. I use you five say, pounds neem cake meal. Oh, God, man. It's just like, you talk about creating mold and rust. You use the more, the more it costs. That's that's how the formula goes. You know, if it costs $100 want, a pound, you use, a, you use a whole pound per plant. That those products, insects, frass, those products are so important. Neem cake, those products are so important and so useful in the right situations for the right person in the right moment. But not in every single run am I going to add those ma- um, crazy amounts because you're going to create these insane and bo- in- imbalances. It's just so like- I won't in any way argue with you about neem because it's a frankly it's a strange thing. It's an oily bug repellent uh, uh, material. I don't necessarily want that in an organic medium. However, I will argue with you just to play devil's advocate about frass. Uh, we have our buddy Frass Valley. We have a couple people in the chat who always advocate frass. So. Why wouldn't we want to use it? It's uh, biological material, <clears throat> pardon me, filled allegedly with protozoa, amoeba, uh, all kinds of higher trophic levels that are going to chow down on the bacteria and potentially pathogenic fungi. Why wouldn't we want to inoculate those? Th- oh, a lot of times amino acids and then also chitin and chitinase. Why wouldn't we want to add those things to the soil medium? You do want to add those things, but you don't want to do it every week on a weekly basis and heavy dr- dr- dramatic, crazy amounts. I think there's people that really overuse these products beyond what the company says. It's not the company's fault by any means. And I know there's customers that see amazing results from it um, because they're using it properly. I think there's, there's the cannabis grower out there that is counting on bro science and not science. Um, There's too much bro science going on out there in the industry. So it is a very important product to be used um, and I think it should be used properly. Bro science. <laughs> he has a, a pot leaf t-shirt. That's the, the best version of the, sorry, choose Dave. That's awesome. Dave always comes in sporting the best clothes. Dude, that was wild. Tripping me out, man. So I hope I did good with that uh, frost question. So I guess just to, to recap, it's not necessarily no frass. It's just that uh, the recommendations are probably bunk, just kind of like nutrients, you know, like pour all the nutrients, bro. It's really good for your plants. You're saying frass maybe in for some specific reason to inoculate a tea or to inoculate your soil medium or whatever else. Yeah, but not. Oh, my God. I've got time. Yeah, let's use it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's got its right things at its right times. And I, I'd urge anybody who wants to do living soil or who is doing living soil to my get a water and soil test. Your biggest nutrient is water. Even if you're a synthetic grower, your biggest nutrient is water. Let that sink in for a second. How good is your water? Okay, well, my water is great. I bring it down to RO. Okay, that's awesome. Well, you've destructured, you've taken all the minerals out of it, and you've got to restructure it back up into the proper way, which is a conversation I know nothing about. I just know that's where that's at. Um, good, clean water is under 150 ppms. Um, I'm really lucky, and I have well water that comes out in between 30 and 60 ppms, so I can use that for foliar spraying. Anything over 150 ppms, you do not want to use that for foliar spraying. Interesting point. Uh, we had another. Are you worried mostly about, about uh, buildups, or what? Are, what are you mostly worried about, by the way, uh, with higher ppm water? Yes, bicarbonate buildups, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, I'm down for a question. Oh, um, Stabby was asking, uh, what are some price points to get into using like your your products? Um, we've got specifically the micro product. Yeah. The micro product, um, it's a 2.5 gallon jug for $71 retail. Um, and the powder to go with that, we would sell you one pound of powder to go with that for $31. Um, usage rates on this stuff is something we're still playing with. Um, 
I personally will use six to 10 milliliters on a weekly root drench um, with a teaspoon to maybe at the most two or three teaspoons of the powder. Um, the powder to wake up the microbes and to do an inoculation takes a surprisingly very little to activate and feed the microbes if you want to do just an inoculation. Now, if you want to do an inoculation and also use a powder as a plant food, because you can do that and it's very soluble, then you can do a lot more powder to go with the microbes where you would consume the powder probably faster than you would consume the liquid. Um, but um, a 2.5 gallon jug will last me probably six to eight months. Um, and I go through a couple pounds of powder every few months. Uh, remember, this is an agricultural program that CDFA approved and has been around for over 10 years in the Central Valley, only used in agriculture. Um, we found this guy, and I can't believe that we're the only buddy in the cannabis industry that's found him farming microbes and producing thousands of gallons of this stuff. Um, but we're coming out with this into the cannabis industry as an agricultural based product because this is what it is, whether you're using this on a small scale or you're using it on a large scale. Um, cannabis is agriculture. You're growing a plant. And on top of that, you should be challenging yourself and growing food with your plants. And that's definitely when it becomes agriculture. You can't question it at that point, whether even if it's in closet. So the further you go down this rabbit hole of living soil, I would highly recommend growing your food with your plants if you have a healthy system obviously, and you know what you're doing, it takes a little bit of trial and error, but uh, strawberries, um, uh, any kind of root like a potato. I use, I run potatoes in my greenhouse in the winter. I didn't do it this year, but I've done it in other past years just to keep the soil moving because, you know, regenerative farming, agricultural farms, they always have something growing in their soil. They always want microbes farming for the plant and farming for the system. They never have bare roots or bare soil. Um, so, yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, do you mind if I ask, uh, what is the powder? I, I don't know. I guess I'm somewhat conscientious about all the stuff that I add to my uh, uh, mediums. Is it like a sugar powder, molasses-based powder? What, what are we, I don't know, aminos? You said you can add more of it as a plant food medium. So what is it primarily? Um, it's primarily kelp, seaweed, um, and volcanic rock dust. Um, and a few other proprietary components that he doesn't really want to talk about for feeding the microbes and activating them. Um, that's $31 a pound and use it on a small basis. Um, and I use that for foliar spraying when I can't root drench or I can't feed the plant in its soil. I want to feed the, the plant itself on its leaf surface. Um, I use that stuff along with the microbes or I'll use it by itself if I'm lazy because I don't want to. Obviously, whenever you use these microbes, you've got to do a lot of cleaning. Um, you've got to really, you know, make sure that you clean everything out with um, probably uh, hydrogen peroxide would be the best thing. Um, so if I'm lazy, I'll just throw some of the powder into the can and foliar spray it out. Um, and it's very important that you make sure you have the highest pressure possible when you're foliar spraying. Um, I recently just got my new foliar spraying can. Is that a Chapman can? No, it's not a Chapman, but it's got Damn, a... that's intense. Dude, this thing is so dope. I got it off of Amazon, and I'll have to figure out how to share the link, but it's stainless steel, and it was like 60 bucks. You Whoa. can take the whole thing apart, but you want a foliar spray at 40 pounds of pressure. Um, any lower, and you're not able to distribute the foliar spray properly to where the plant can absorb it. So very important stuff there. And at that high pressure, you're not killing the uh, the microbes that you're trying to fill your spray? No, the microbes are, are super, super resilient. Just like Dan was saying, there's microbes that have survived um, at hundreds and hundreds of degrees of temperature. And obviously those are microbes that have changed their metabolism to survive and feed off of something in that area. They're not surviving that's, unless they're eating in that area. So that's like a human, like a fungal body. Could be. Could we be why are fungal human. bodies as a joke. Da -da, ba -da, bam! Nobody got it. It's a we're fun. Continue. Microbes in the soil. <laughs> yeah, but you also <laughs> need fungi body. in the soil too. So um yeah, the um the powder product is awesome. We have 
couple different powder products. We obviously have the calcium and chitin powder product to breed the warrior microbes, but the normal M food product is just to breed overall diversity in your soil. Um, using it at small rates just feeds the microbes. Using it at high rates um, will definitely feed the plant. I've gotten into the point where I'd burn tips, burn the leaf tips on there, and I'm like, oh my God, okay, we got to back off and for a little bit. So it can be very powerful stuff. So probably an industry disruptor by a little bit. So sorry. Sounds intriguing. Speaking of industry, industry disruptors, uh, Empire Dave's here. Whoa, whoa. We got no audio from Dave. Yeah, there's no yeah, audio. Your mic, his mic's not working. Way to go, Dave. But he can hear us sign though. language. Yeah, we can make fun of him now. Well, it, yeah, it would probably help right? if you put the microphone in. Does that work? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, it would probably right, help so if funny. you plugged it in, Dave. I mean, it's just you know, just adapting my freaking video game setup over here and just trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. But I heard a dab bell, so I need to get a dab going. No, I've been doing good. Thanks for smoke. having me on the show again, guys. Much appreciated. <clears throat> they said Dave's Oops. not here, man. Dave's not here, man. It used to be my tagline for the longest time. Uh, I think it still so, is on my Instagram, actually. What's uh, what's everybody smoking on tonight? What do we got? What do we got going tonight? Oh, I'm gonna I be uh, to join us some, uh, Roswell here. Ooh, I'm gonna be cold starting some of uh, Tenazi's rosin over here. Well, aren't you just so lucky? I'm just. Damn, what I kind of blonde it is? I can see it from here. I'm just down to the pickings, my guy. It's just, it's just. Uh... Tyler got some diamonds over there. Down to the yeah. pickings. Oh no! <sighs> Man down. Man down. It's okay. They're nuggets. I can pick them up. It's not a problem. I didn't like the sound of that. But uh, I like the look of what Tyler's got going on over there. He's got like a little baby jar full of diamonds. Right. Kind of jealous. Yeah. And Took yes, everybody, his out. vehicle is in park. He is not driving anywhere. <laughs> it's a Maserati as well. You just can't see the logo. Yep. Dismiss the Honda Civic logo. <laughs> That's it's just based on That's for cosmetics. For Theft prevention. Yes, exactly. It's theft prevention. So, oh, my Tyler, what smoke. boost number? Okay. Um, wait, wait, wait. It sounds like uh, people are getting a little confused here because Hi Wally said, "Should I not mix insect frass it with chitin into my soil?" No, Hi Wally. We're saying you do. You can add insect frass. It's good to add insect frass, but you don't need to add it all the time. You need to make sure you're staying within the recommendations of the manufacturer. And if they don't give you man, if they don't give you recommendations, use very, very little of it. And you'll see an amazing response with small amounts of these products. You'd be surprised how little you can use to see a response. Yeah, Cold like stone. I was, uh, I was looking at the, the Frass Valley package the other day, actually, when I was uh, doing some transplanting, and it says to amend the soil, they only recommend like a cup per gallon, and you know, that's uh, a fairly decent amount, yeah. but when you're top dressing, they only want you to do one to two tablespoons for uh, a five gallon plant. So it's a lot I mean, it less. It makes sense, right? Own. Like it's 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 the, the way they sell it to you, the, the frass company or whatever. They'll say, "Well, bro, it's like a bug graveyard, and bugs don't want to go to a bug graveyard." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, that's true, but at the same time, if you're a starving bug and you're already there and you have nowhere else to go, you're not necessarily going to pick up and leave that bug graveyard. You're just going to dial down into that bug graveyard." So it's like, why are you adding that much bug shit? Like maybe find a different way to solve your problems if you're trying to derail bugs or something find something that they actually don't like instead of just other bug bones or whatever um i don't know that that's sound logic right like so in other words i use frass to inoculate some of those bacteria because you know some of those bug bones and poops and whatever have useful microbes and then some chitinase some proteins amoebas and all kinds of other shit but to a limited degree not like all the fucking time and not pounds of it yeah the scientist scientist side of it 
that uh, my agronomists, agronomists that created our products that I talked to on a weekly basis would say, um, you're adding that insect frass to the soil so we can train microbes to eat chitin. Well, that's great. Well, we don't always need that to happen. That's something that's great in certain transition phases at great certain times and stuff like that. But for me, you know, you got to think microbes that eat chitin, that means they eat anything that's made of chitin. You're going to have beneficial things that are made of chitin as well. So my product is to be used when you have an issue. When you have a problem, you use it uh, twice a week for three weeks and then you should have wiped out that issue. And then we want to go back to our normal microbes and go back to feeding the native microbes to repopulate a beneficial population. So with microbes, it's all about, I look at it when I go to one of these events. I had, it's a great thing when they're standing around with all these people and you say, okay, if there was one bad person in this event and they started doing some horrible stuff, I guarantee all of us would run over there and stomp them in a heartbeat. It works the same damn way in the soil if there's enough good people. You know, and that's the reason for having a shit ton of beneficial microbes is we want to outcompete the bad fungi. We want to outcompete the bad bacteria. We want to outcompete the, the bad bacteria that are called ciliates that just destroyed everything and create mold in there. So, you know, there's certain uses for these products at certain times that just to apply to people. And all I got to say is, where's the science at it? You know, you want me to add a cup of this or a cup of that? How does that really apply to me? You know, which that question is can only be answered with a soil test if you're a living soil going in that direction. So. That's definitely the bro science aspect of the whole kind of living soil or any, any other kind of high minded pursuit where you can kind of social signal, right? Organic food or anything else. There's tons of bro science. We're like, well, no, bro, like adding some of these vitamins every single day, it's going to totally be good for you. And then down the road, you realize, oh, no, that's actually bad for your kidneys. Or, for example, in your soil, like you said, you're maybe to use an extreme metaphor, you're, you're throwing those chitinase or, or chitin bacteria, uh, you're throwing them in like a SWAT team every week or every feeding or every day, you're basically throwing the big guns, every fucking feeding. And the rest of your community is like, bro, we're already chill down here. But in the meantime, the SWAT team is coming again and again and again, where you could dial it back a bit and maybe only send in the SWAT team or special forces. Maybe we can say it that way once in a while, maybe once a month or something to clean house. Is that maybe a, more or less a good metaphor? Exactly. Or is that what you're getting to? Hmm. Exactly. You know, we want this super beneficial system to be functioning as best as possible. And uh, we want to use as little as possible. If you go down the, the pathway of soil testing and reamending your soil, you'll find through that process, every time you go to do that, your amount of amendments that you need decreases. So even there's pathways I've seen with growers that have been doing this for four or five years. Um, and they kind of can predict what happens a little bit. So then they do a soil test like every three runs just to make sure their predictions are going right. Because if you go through a whole bunch of soil testing, saturated paste tests, and you see these trends, you start, okay, maybe I'll save money and not pay for the soil test and the recommendation this time and go through the same path I went through last time by the same amount of amendments, re-amend. And, you know, you can get to guessing real quick, you know, is all I got to say and start saving money. But the amount of money that you'll save by going through that process and cutting out all the bullshit you didn't know that you didn't need, you don't know if you didn't if you don't know is all I'm really trying to say with the soil testing. Especially let's not forget if I add an extra half a cup of whatever bullshit that I don't need, that doesn't cost much anything. And who gives a shit if I lose a quarter ounce of yield? But if you do it at 20,000 acres scale, it's a whole different issue. Or even an indoor environment where you have a thousand plants, suddenly your cost goes up, the cost of fucking up goes up quite a bit more on and on and on. Even more reason to do a soil test. Well, yeah, it's, oh, it's what's called a compounding issue. Mm -hmm. Yep. How much you're gonna let it compound before you take that weight off your shoulders and count on somebody else to let you know you're going in the right direction. Um, and I think if I can focus on what I feel the future of cannabis is, um, is bringing tools to the normal farmer that major agriculture has, which is like, if you go to the doctor and you're super sick and you're gonna die, 
they take a blood test and they figure out what's going wrong with you by looking at your blood levels to see where do you have a liver disease? Do you have this? Do you have that? Where's your nutrient levels? How are you surviving? And that's the first thing they do. Um, so constituting that on a plant level, we in normal agriculture, they do plant sap tests. You collect a whole bunch of leaves, you send them into the laboratory, and they tell you your nutrient levels and where your nutrient levels are at and how to correct them. So I know farms now that do plant sap testing on a weekly basis on their cannabis and hemp, and that dictates their feeding schedules and feeding regimens down to macro minerals, down to macro micronutrients on a gram level on an acre, down to the guy. I've got a guy in the Bay Area doing this because it costs $75 to send in your leaves. And he's running his whole nutrient program based off of that because you don't know if you can back off unless you know the plant's got enough potassium or nitrogen. And you don't know that unless you know what's going on in the leaves. So you take some bottom leaves, you take in some top leaves that gives the lab the ability to compare the bottom leaves to the top leaves because the top leaves are going to have a different nutrient level than the bottom level. The bottom leaves are going to have the first deficiencies you're going to see. The top leaves are going to look the best as possible. We always know like the top always looks the best. So we got to compare the top to the bottom. Unless you have russet mites. Well, then you should probably uh, slow Pray. down watering. And, uh, <laughs> Pray to all of your gods. Well, if you have russet mites, I really don't think a soil sample is the, the first thing on your mind. If you plan on continuing, it should be on your mind. Yeah, I would I would want to address the russet mites before I got to getting a soil sample done. Man, I derailed the poor guy. Get back to talking. Sorry. Well, that's what gets me to when you send in a soil sample to these people and you have a recommendation to grow rue and he calls you up to do your consultation. And he says, so how the russet mites been, bro? <laughs> and you're like, oh, I've been fighting them for six months or six years. Cause he's like, I can look at your soil test and tell why you've got, you've got russet mites or you've got mold. So you got You can cal things calculate up into the soil. That's what Scott Granola Crest of Soil Services, where he's really brought a lot of this stuff to light. He's the guy who really showed people how bad. Are you, was are you touching on the plant health pyramid? Maybe I'm where we're, you know, yeah. we're a few joints into this, the, the basic needs of the plant. And once you fulfill the basic needs, then you move on to the next basic needs. I'm forgetting. I don't, I don't remember. I have the chart in front of me. That's what you're talking about, right? Yes. Yes. And I highly urge everybody to listen to the podcast about the uh, plant health pyramid, advanced eco agriculture and John Kempf. That's probably the best thing you can listen to. And then go watch his 45 minute video on foliar spraying because it'll change your life. OK, that one is about, you know, you can change a plant. You can change the soil. The fastest way to correct anything is with foliar spraying and and beneficially foliar spraying for the health of the plant. So. And even with organics. So, I mean, to, to, to tangibly give someone a connection to this, let's say they have, what's a typical, what's a typical de uh, deficiency anybody's had recently? Uh, nitrogen is calm. Nitrogen is easy. Uh, phosphorus Calmag. or CalMag. CalMag is an easy one. Organically or inorganically, what's your go-to? To I never had deficiencies, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, fuck well. you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole thing with cow mag is you probably really yeah, need Dave. the cow, but you didn't really need the mag. How do you know if you needed mag if you didn't do a test? It's on the periodic table, bro. Right next to the cow is mag, I think. Oh, yeah. It's a well-known advanced cow. nutrients cow, uh, periodic table anyway. Well, I mean, they're sold in cow mag bottles. Is it right, bro. just come together? Uh, like I mean, it's right next to the pH oh, on the periodic table. It's easy byproduct. It's easier for them to package it because it comes like that. But – um. You probably need the calcium, but you probably didn't need the magnesium because what if your water already has magnesium and you're pumping in, you know, 40 ppm's of magnesium every week anyways? You know, you didn't know because you didn't do a water test or a soil test, so, you know. Hey, uh, Tyler, we had another question from chat. Uh, you are the, the sales rep for Grassroots, right? I hope that's a, a good thing to answer. Yes. yes to <laughs> no. Um, one of the one of the uh, one of the guys watching, they were curious if you knew anything about why uh, your products aren't shipping to Canada. Um, we use Black Swallow Living Soils in Canada right now because because they've taken the emphasis to import our products to resell it. 
Um, Grassroots Fabric Pots is a small family company owned by a husband and wife. We've got 19 employees. Um, we have not signed up or bridged the gap to be our own broker for international services. Um, we have filled out the paperwork so we can be our own broker so we can ship internationally. Um, if you call me directly, I will take the time to take the products that you need and the address that you have and find the most aggressive shipping quote that I can and get that product to you in Canada. Um, but I would highly recommend just working with Nathan and Rob at Black Swallow Living Soils because if you're in Canada, you probably already know about them. And honestly, I've taken two trips to Canada. And if you're using any other soil in Canada besides Nathan's Black Swallow Soil or their Kiss Mix, um, it really wouldn't be anything that's acceptable in California in any facility. Um, there's a couple of cool things up there, but nothing is like... When you say that, what do you mean? Most people don't have any idea what California fucking means other than, oh, California beaches and shit. Um, I kind of just use that as a basis because everybody knows California is where it's at with quality. Um, and when people look at soil and they look at the quality of it, like I, I, I don't like being having a brand on my chest and then talking crap about brands, but it just tends to happen, unfortunately. But let's say there's a brand out there that is great for synthetic stuff that everybody uses all the time. Let's say 707 soil you know, comes in that bag. You can use the bag as a pot if you want to outdoor. That's a great media, but it's sterile. It doesn't have any biology. Um, not to say that's a bad thing. That's probably great could be for super out. soil. Yeah. Great if you're super bad. soil and you're going to load everything up and cause yourself problems anyways. Um, do you have opinions on super soil while we're at it? We have somebody here who is a diehard super soil grower. God, 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 what man. do you got to say God's about fire. super soil? It will blow your mind if you do a soil test how much money you can save on amendments. Oh, I bet. I, I know I'm overkill. I know I'm overkill. Well, do you have problems with bugs? No, I don't. I have oh. gnat problem right now. I have a gnat. I have a gnat issue because I'm actually I'm. Well, or basically bottom watering, letting the uh, fabric pots soak up all the water in the trays. So that's uh, I'm seeing a lot more gnats for sure. But you got a but you got a laser beam at the house to take care of the gnats, my guy. Why don't you? I don't know. You oh, they... <laughs> hey, you know what? Those are fungus gnats, and those are fungus gnats that are made out of chitin. And I know somebody who's got a product that can help you for pretty inexpensively. Well, there's chi I put a. Uh... Frass into insect frass into the super soil mix. So. But do you have the microbes there to train them to eat chitin? If you haven't inoculated it with good microbes, you can't. They can't do anything with the chitin. I use recharge, and I'm training those microbes daily. Or treat. Yeah. No recharge is awesome. No recharge would do that for you. So right. I so I use mammoth pea and recharge. So that I awesome. think that takes care of the full bananas there. Oh, oh yeah, no that that definitely does. You're, you're hitting the right stuff. Those are great uh, concentration levels. I think recharge is, I think, honestly, what I'm most impressed right now on the market with besides my product because it has the most strain and it has the most uh, potency within those strains or concentration levels. You can see a difference. Like if you have 24 hours after one, one feeding, you can see am amazing differences. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Physically, you can like, because normally you can't see your plants change from day to day. But when you use recharge and you're like, whoa, shit, those they're greener, the taller, they're standing up. It's nice. You can tell. When it's nice to see a product that works fast like that. Yeah. And I like that. Uh, obviously, the recharge product is a powder product, so they're not selling you a whole bunch of water. So that's got to feel good, too. Damn right. Powdered up. Powdered up. Right. Where are we at, fellas? Uh, we got... 30 minutes left. Anything else you guys wanted to talk about? Nope. I mean, Cut the show. That's it. Shut Tyler's, it down. See you later. Tyler's been over here. This is the last show ever. Tyler's just been over here knowledge bombing us all night, man. Thank uh, you for that. Do, do you happen to know, I, I assume, I guess the answer, but do you happen to know how the microbes are farmed? I mean, what, why is there 20,000 as opposed to 20,001 or whatever? Is it lab grown? Is it some kind of like a formula that he puts all together? How is it put together? So um, David, the owner, has collected soil samples from over 20 different locations uh, 
uh, locally and internationally as well. And yes, he does farm and incubate those microbes. Um, it is classified, which doesn't, this sounds super technical, but it's not much, but it's a level one classification laboratory uh, where we can breed and farm microbes. I, I say we, but it's not me at all by any means. Um, it's David. Uh, so to go into the history of the product, it was created over 20 years ago by David's father. Uh, he was the first one of the first people to start making mycorrhizal inoculants for the soil. Uh, they were some of the first people to start putting um, humic acids in the soil. And, and they and said, we really funny if his name was they growing weed back then, you think trying to do these tests. Um, there was a little bit of weed being grown. Uh, the father is from the humble. <laughs> area. Uh, it's definitely. Um, yeah. But they're, they have a thousand acre pear farm in uh, the, in uh, the Delta. Um, so that's where a lot of, a lot of stuff is started, but, um, so this product has been CDFA approved for 10 years. So every two years they go through the CDFA process where we have to prove the claims that we're making in the product. We have to prove the microbes that are there. So how we prove they're there is we use DNA sequencing. Um, so just like you would DNA sequence yourself to see what microbes are there, uh, there's a huge community of agronomists that are creating a DNA database of microbes. And there's thousands of microbes that are added into this database on a daily basis. Um, so what we do is we take our samples of our product and we have it DNA sequenced so we can see what microbes were hitting on that list. So this is, by the way, kind of a relevant thing, because just a few years ago, we don't have to cast any aspersions or name any names or anything else. But just a couple of years ago, the state of Oregon, they haven't released the current uh, year reports as far as I remember. Maybe they have more recently, but they did testing on a bunch of microbial products as well as they always do testing on uh, uh, synthetic nutrients, organic nutrients, everything else. And the, the microbial products, most of them were coming up zero um, recordable CFUs of fungus, bacteria, or super low CFUs of bacteria, on and on and on. A lot of those products were coming up essentially with no DNA in them, which was one of the tests, right? Is that essentially like you're basically, I, I don't know, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Or are um, we on different wavelengths? Sorry. Uh, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, there. never mind, never mind. Sorry, I, know, I derailed you again. I do want to say I would be scared shitless if I was a legislator running a system and trying to apply rules and then some farmers throw this book and these white pages at me of microbes that are 10 pages thick and I have to decipher if that microbe's good or bad. I'm probably just going to say all the microbes are bad and we don't want to do any microbes. The you know, point is that they tried to test and they actually came back as like zero detectable microbes essentially on many of the products. So they were essentially selling garbage. That, that's basically what it comes down to. Allegedly, okay. I mean, those products probably say otherwise. Many of them, I think, argued about it too. They said the methodology, the testing methodology was bad and blah, 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 whatever, right? Well, anyway. there, was a, there was a stint in time when like Mycofusion up in Oregon got in trouble. ODA went through and tested a lot of his products and came back with nothing in it. Stop sale, all that crazy stuff. I don't know. I mean, they did that to a lot of companies though. I mean, Washington did it. California did it. Yeah. It, it happens all the time. That's just part of the process. The laws always start as strict as possible, and then they, they back off from there. Um, but getting back to that product, we've DNA sequenced to see what microbes are there, which gives us the ability to see what of those microbes, what they do. Do they fix calcium? Do they fix nitrogen? Do they keep people in line? What do they do there? Um so we use the DNA sequencing to make sure there's also no bad guys in what we're growing and what our starting material is. Um, so we do have our own worm farm in this process where we've taken those samples. Genghis Unchained Us. Huh? Genghis Unchained Us is the microbe you're looking for, I think. Huh. Sorry, it just keeps, whatever, it's a stupid joke. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> we're high. We just make jokes. Um, but uh, we take uh, the, the microbes uh, from our worm farm and obviously take them into a tea-like process um, where we feed the microbes and breed them into a certain uh, level of population that we want. Um, and then what they do is they put the microbes to sleep. So um, there's scientists and uh, people that are digging up the Egyptians um, that one great scientific word for those people, it's slipping me right now. 
um, but they were able to find archaeologists. Archaeologists, thank you, uh, Dan the man hitting with that. Uh, archaeologists found uh, microbes in stasis with the Egyptians, and then they fed them some water and some food, and they woke them up. Then they did DNA sequencing on them to find out what kind of microbes were were there so and what how that, beneficial they were. You mean that with like the Egyptian mummies in, or something? What do you mean? Well, that kind of ties back into what was it like? Uh, they called it like Tut's Revenge or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like when they started opening up uh, coffins and stuff like that, a lot of people were getting sick because the microbes were getting into their nostrils and going down into their lungs and whatnot, uh, getting re-wet and becoming alive again and then populating in basically foreign bodies and people were getting real sick because they didn't know how to fight them off. So the point of that is that shows you how strong microbes are and how they can survive because what they do is they go into stasis. They go into sleep mode. They pretty much cover themselves in a shell that's impenetrable by the heat, by the sunlight, by the air, by the water. They go to sleep in a stasis mode. So that's what our product is, is our product is a stasis compost tea. So it's been put to sleep. It's brewed, it's put to sleep, and it's bottled, and it's able to have a shelf life of one year. Um, In the harshest conditions with uh, a clear bottle in the sun at 110 degrees after 17 months, we've still had um, 70% life in the bottle. That's positive. So we don't obviously recommend keeping it for 17 months. We recommend, you know, uh, keeping it in a cool, dry place and all that good stuff. Um, But it is uh, amazing how resilient the microbes are. It really is. And how little microbe food it it takes to activate them and feed them. And obviously activate and feed your native microbes that you may not have been taken advantage of. It stands to reason if we can, uh, uh, because, you know, the show is for multiple kinds of growers, if we can kind of transpose it to other things. Uh, A lot of our growers, uh, I I haven't seen them in chat, but St. Bernard's, for example, he's a big fan of that same podcast that you're a fan of. They talk about dry down cycles. And recently there's been some evidence about terpene boosting, even THC boosting through dry down cycles towards the end of flower. I guess the question I'm having is uh, maybe those dry down cycles can be useful if you're doing a particular thing, if you're aiming for a particular goal. Uh, and the bacteria or the, the micro, micro life is not necessarily dying back. It's potentially going dormant. It's not necessarily then being active in terms of creating active exudates, but it's not essentially dying off. It's just going dormant in the medium. Is that fair, do you think? Or the plants are rapidly consuming them during that dry down process. And then they're seeing a reaction because you got to understand roots can absorb microbes and eat them or the, the plants the microbes can be absorbed into the plant um, which goes into the advanced eco agriculture you know they can answer those questions properly but i i would say where's your science that's telling you the benefits are coming from your dry down that would be my question is is that what's benefiting you i i mean uh, i i or is it ancillary that's a fair point that's a fair question so I don't know the answer. It'd be, be good to know. Well, we'll see yeah. one of these days. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, definitely, if I can say anything, just foliar spray, guys. Foliar spray. Yeah. We've had a couple of questions actually in the chat about uh, transplanting strategies. And you guys sell uh, pot sizes. And I actually, I'm quite fond of your transplanter pots because you can kind of just yeah. velcro them open. Uh, what is your preferred strategy for you you can pick one you can talk about both synthetics versus organics i'm an organic uh, grower i I grow in living soil so for example what would be your strategy from seed or clone up to a flower pot to to use your products basically um definitely obviously the transplantinator is really awesome because it's got velcro on both sides to really encompass the whole root ball and make sure nothing falls apart to just transplant it to eliminate shock you know root shock a transplant shock uh will kill 30 percent of your yield 30 percent of your plant health as well um i can i know a lot of people love transplanting and they feel there's a huge benefit from transplanting but everything i've learned about plants and agriculture would tell me that you want to transplant them as less as possible um and i've also seen people that get the most benefit from um 
never transplanting or only transplanting once or twice. Um, when you talk to anybody in agriculture, transplanting is one of the most scariest things in the world. Um, so I can recommend, you know, hey, let's let's transplant and then let's take that root ball and let's dunk that into a tea, a compost tea, some some uh, uh, some mammoth, some recharge. I want to freshly inoculate those roots directly right before I put it into that soil. I also want to make sure that that root ball is super wet. So the soil that's there just doesn't suck up every ounce of water that's there because we all have had that one time where you transplant a seedling into soil and the soil wasn't wet enough and mm. that soil mass sucked all the water out of it and wilted your right. plant. So I think a lot of people can avoid a lot of issues by dunking that root ball in a beneficial inoculant before they go transplant into the soil. Um, you're going to see us specifically come out with some really cool products over the next year as we can digest um, everything through this process. Um, but definitely using something like Great White. Um, it's amazing how little of that product you can use. Um, or even, um, I mean, let's like, even let's even um, make this clearer for people. Why would you to to, to explain why you? Because it's always important to know why you do something. Uh, why would you want to dunk your root ball or even your seed mass or your your even your little seed stem into any kind of a beneficial environment? In a nutshell, you're you're giving the plant the things that it needs. You're teaching the, the, the plant to fish for life, basically. You're not just giving it a fish. You're giving it the microbes that it needs to feed itself for life, more or less, right? You're giving it the ability to defend against anything else that you're putting it into as well. You know, you're, you're inoculating it with beneficial uh, microorganisms to outcompete anything bad. Um, because there's bad organisms that will be good and beneficial to the plant if the right people are around, the right beneficial organisms are there. So there's multiple times when they can see farsirium in the soil, which is a horrible fungus disease, but it's not actually doing anything because there's a lot of other beneficial stuff around it and it can't take hold. So, you know, inoculating those things before they go into those new environments is definitely the most beneficial thing you can do is add beneficials to an environment you hope to be beneficial to them. Yep, yep. Anybody got anything? Questions, gentlemen? Goodness. No. I haven't been saying much tonight. I only use water microbes in the soil since we know. do have uh ross jeff is on the show we have well he knows how to to transplant plants of course but uh some of our folks that follow him uh grow synthetically what are your strategies because you said you have 30 percent or 35 percent uh, of your growers are synthetic growers what's your strategies for uh synthetic growers to up pot from seed or clone yeah i would definitely um you know a lot of people are going to start in a, in a small container like a four by four plastic and go into a one gallon um i see a lot of people who go from that one gallon to a five gallon or even flower out in the one gallon um i visited whole facilities that have functioned great off of uh, small four by four plastics and then going right into a one gallon fabric pot um that always works great um, and I'd be really interested in how much more of a benefit they'd get, even if they use one of our living soil containers, just because it would hold a little bit more moisture, um, and create a different, different root system is really what the, the living soil container is going to do because it allows the roots to grow all the way to the edge, but then air prune as well, a couple inches down. So I know I keep hitting. On I think we never got, yeah, we never got a chance for you to, to really dig into that. I think you, you were going to say how, uh, in fact, I think I derailed you, uh, that mm -hmm. root pruning is not uh, actually as good as everyone thinks it is. And I've thought personally, I've thought, oh, root pruning is the shit, bro. I've said it on this show that it's amazing before. Well, why is it? And your strategy with the new living soil pots is you actually have something different. At the bottom, you're still root pruning, potentially if it's lifted up off the ground. But the sides are, like you said, woven plastic that are kind of impermeable almost all the way down to the, the bottom couple inches. Why is that so much better? You know, it stops the water from bleeding out the side. It forces the water to go down and out as a normal water column would do in nature. So honestly, it's a plant and it does function really well in nature. Even if you're synthetically feeding it, I still think you would see a huge benefit from using these pots because it would help the plant's roots function in a way that's more 
positive to nature because in nature there's certain roots that are gravitatively pulled to go down lower and there's certain roots that are not they're more like top feeders so i think it would help that situation Even versus seeds and clones that don't have tap roots right yeah, definitely. They they don't have tap roots and clones, but they still have a fibrous root system, and some of their roots are gravitated towards the moisture and the water down below. Well, air pruning is not that great because you're getting that drying pattern from all these different angles. So the plant is trying to grow in whatever way it can, which definitely is not natural. So the, in a fabric pot, when you're growing and you see your roots, you have to dig back a few inches to find moisture to find your roots. Well, now if you use a living soil container, you're going to find roots that grow all the way to the edge and then circle downwards. So if we can fill the container with more roots, we can have a bigger plant in a smaller container. So I think the future is half plastic, half fabric and is the perfect emergence in between a plastic pot and a fabric pot because there's no way you can't doubt how beneficial how great things go in a plastic five gallon or seven gallon pot indoors it goes great um you can't I love this, i love this idea because i do the bottom feed now with just plain water but when i do like recharge and the mammoth i top water and i fucking hate brother the one thing I hate when you go to top water because it's, it's not as wet as everything else, so it wants to like immediately run out the side of a fabric part, and all your like microbes and recharge is running out the side of your pots. It's not even getting into your soil. That's one of the reasons I stopped using my fabric pots. They weren't um like I think they were like an off-brand one, but I was so like, this, ah, that's this idea right here is fucking phenomenal. Bro. I have this I have this liner media. in my uh in my mini bed that uh, Tyler made for me about. Psh, a year or so ago that probably two years ago it was a uh, the 20 by 20 by 12 he, they managed to stick one of these liners in that as well and it works great you know there i can go over to it at any time because i have the blue mats in it and i can feel the very bottom couple inches of it is moist you just walk over like it's not leaking out the sides or anything but i can walk over and i can put my hand on the side of the pot and it's moist and the rest of the sides of the pot are dry. So he, you know, Tyler's not lying when he says the, the stuff's, you know, it forces water down. And even when I, I water in by hand, it doesn't really come out the sides unless I'm going like, you know, ape shit crazy. Sorry, guys, I got a phone call there. My dad came out of nowhere making sure that I'm going to get in the dirt road. So sorry about that. Uh, that's all good. Got to take care of business, man. Um, but Tanasi, take some plastic wrap from the kitchen and go wrap those fabric pots on the outside with some plastic wrap. You get the same thing. Oh, you just gave up a secret. We were trying to get people to buy your pots, Tyler. <laughs> well, then he's going to get all these weird questions because he's going to post a photo because he's going to have so much of a better response. He's going to post a photo. Then everybody's going to ask him all these weird questions. And then he's going to say, no, just go buy the grassroots fabric pots. It's way better. So I still win. Okay. Okay. I like that. No, it's the build a soil approach, you know, like he'll teach you how to do it however way you want. If you want to do it yourself, he'll tell you how to do it. He'll also happily sell you the product that's probably a little bit better, a little bit fancier, and honestly costs a little bit more. And you'll basically develop a relationship with him where you feel like you owe him kind of allegiance. Because I mean, he's on your side too, on some level, right? So I, I appreciate that. You can tell people how to do things in a low, like low cost way, cost effective way, and also sell them something too. It always comes back, man. Do good and good will come is what I was always taught. So if I can help him be more successful, it's always going to come back. Appreciate that. Definitely. What are your thoughts on, uh, I know I've had a question about this. I think it's come up in chat too. I hope it's come up in chat of uh, top water versus bottom watering. T Tanasi alluded to this, I guess, uh, even in terms of overall strategy, you know, like I oftentimes just basically top water, but you can, you can avoid pests. Tanasi has, you know, fungus gnats. You can avoid a lot of issues or you can accomplish different goals potentially by bottom watering. Does that play into how you guys design your pots at all? Or do you kind of, to everybody no matter what um i would say that the bottom watering thing is definitely really interesting and the whole sip system thing is definitely very interesting it's just unfortunately 
flirting with the anaerobics a little bit too much that I don't ever really suggest it. And it's amazing that, I mean, not amazing. I think there's people out there that would be surprised how successful they can be trying something different or something, finding what works for you. You know what I mean? But um, that's just a little bit too much moisture down there for me. Um, I like to have a, a huge, I like to promote drainage whenever we can elevate the pot up um, and promote that drainage and create the most natural system we can. Um, I just go back to nature. What does nature do? It, it waters from the top. It circles, cycles down and drains out. So that's what I go back to. On some level we can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying a different kind of way to do things, but ultimately nature spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, perfecting it like a fucking machine, water pouring off a rock one after another until finally this system works. Why mess with it on some level, right? Like why argue with it? At, at the same time, when you say that, the whole show you've been talking about foliar feeding and nature sure as fuck does not foliar feed except for with water, right? So actually we're arguing with ourselves to be honest. No, I mean, I would say that you'd be amazed at how many minerals are in the dust that blows along, blows around in the air. You know, um, it's amazing. Um, the sands from like the great dunes somewhere come over and feed the trees from wherever, you know, there's amazing stuff that they talk about. Um, but um, I would say in a, in a way of benefiting your plant um, in a beneficial health way, um, that's where you can drive the plant forward when you can't root drench, because that's what we see with some living soil growers is they're trying to maintain this static moisture. And if they were to feed that soil with more water, they would break that line and be way too wet for way too long, creating problems in that soil. And if you, feel for like example, blue mats, if you're trying to water in more compost tea or something is where you're getting to. Exactly. If, you know, let's say, okay, so we, we, we want to drive the plant forward more because we feel like we're the force that drives the plant forward. Well, if you want to do that, then you should, you know, benefit the plant in a, in a foliar spray, the plant in a way that benefits its health, not foliar spraying it with pesticides. We should be using um, aloe vera, kelp, fulvic acid, silica, boron, you know, those little micronutrients that the plant absolutely loves that it probably is not getting from your soil or maybe not getting from your nutrient plant, whether it's synthetic or organic um, or, you know, peat, cocoa, living soil. Um, you know, that's one definite way to drive your plant health further. If you've got super, super healthy plants that are ringing above a 10 on the bricks meter, then you don't really have to worry about russet mites and mold because your plant's so healthy. It's got so much sugar in it. Um, you guys all, uh, uh, russet mites, caterpillars, um, any of those biting or sucking pests, they don't have a pancreas. They cannot process sugar. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. Everyone thinks that bugs love sugar, but they can't eat it. Yeah. Or you're saying if you grow dank, bugs don't want it. If you that's grow exactly dank saying. that's got a lot of sugar in it, the bugs can't eat it. They can't process it. That's why you have a garden and you've got some plants that are fucked up with russet mites and mold. And there's a plant right next to it. That's got nothing. You're like, what? How is that possible? Well, the other plants healthy enough to resist it. And we wouldn't know that unless we use that refractometer and we measured our health of our plant. If the, if it's below 10, it's susceptible to all of those things. If it's above 10, it's photosynthesizing on a way high enough for it to produce its own sugars so much that it's producing sugar out of its of its, it's uh, able to activate its secondary metabolites and oh. still keep the this the primaries running efficiently. Because it's photosynthesizing. They're not much to Nazi. They're like 20 bucks, maybe. They're all made in freaking China and stuff. I'm sure the real French ones way back in the day were super expensive, but now they're super cheap. And then you had to take a, I, I use a pair of vice grip pliers and I took um, some metal pipe and I cut it up and I welded it onto some pliers so I can make a, a squeezer thing 
so I can take a little tiny leaf and I can squeeze out a drip Ooh. out of it. Um, uh -huh. Because the next step is you put that drip onto a pH meter, you put that drip on the calcium meter, and you put that drip onto all these other meters so you can uh -huh. start figuring out your levels yourself. Um, so that gets super deep into where you need a consultant. But yeah. Right. That's some high end shit right there. Oh, well, I'm going to charge you for talking any more about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're just about the end of the show here. And uh, Tyler, I can't thank you enough for all the knowledge you came show. over and just dumped on us tonight, man. Uh, you were wonderful. And as always, well, we love having you here with us. Um, you you said you were going to be at Indo Expo, correct? Um, yes. Are you guys, guys going to have your own booth this year? Or are you hanging out with the Build-A-Soil guys? Or what are you doing? Um, we have our own booth because obviously the concentrated biology is becoming a bigger thing now. So we want to uh, get that concentrated biology out there and be talking about microbes of people. So we've got our own booth that's gonna be, uh, directly across from blue mats, which I believe my booth number is three, three, four. So if you're by the blue mat guys, just turn around and start screaming okay. and I'll find you. Um, or something weird like that. We'll scream out you. Or dank, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, most of the, uh, the eo show should be there in uh one form or another so cool well, i got a house i've rented airbnb um so we'll have to get together and and definitely get some dinner or something like that have a big smoke out awesome so sounds like a plan man tyler's spot i yeah, mean party. apparently we like weed and stuff so i mean we might have some i know the perfect place we'll to get dinner man i'll make reservations hell yeah yeah awesome, man. Are, let's are, do that are we going to park burger no, we're going to go to Denver's very first steakhouse. Ooh. Okay. Okay. How old are those steaks? They're, uh, there's a ancient. slightly eight, aged. They they have fucking aged ancient. Ones for bro. sure. It'll probably cost you about $50, though. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I'm down. I'm down for steak dinner on Indo yeah. all day, baby. Let's do it. Yep. If we're all, we're all paying individually, I am so down. <laughs> no, it's all on you, man. Sorry, you're on the show. That's the cost. I mean, that was the deal. You knew that ahead of time. Fuck me. Yeah, you bro. didn't know that. Sorry. Don't you have like a company the fine print, man. account? Like, Do you realize how many thing. people watch this show? I mean, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Come on. <laughs> also, I'm really a big fan of Scotch. I will you only can totally take justify the ROI and older. Hundred percent. Let's start talking about high end Scotch or whiskey. That's my favorite. Ooh. That's food. Well, it's on you. So I mean, just keep talking. I'm oh, kidding. Man. I'm oh. kidding. There is a Sorry. spot up by uh, Broomfield Airport. It's actually on airport property. They claim to have the largest selection of whiskey in Colorado. Wow. We should visit that for like 30 minutes and then leave before it gets crazy. It's really good. I've been there you a couple said before times. Before it gets crazy, so, you mean before you start spending, you know, half your sales? The, the <laughs> coolest thing about weed. If, if anyone wants to know why I like to grow weed the most, I mean, the, other than the fact that it's just fucking awesome and you can have weed that you can grow and you can smoke it, is the fact that I can create a 25-year-old art bag. I can create a fucking 50-year-old any the, the fuck I want from Kentucky or Japan or anything else. I can create it in my basement. If I do it right and plant the right genetics, grow with the right organic pots, top feed the right way, use the right clean microbe focused or even potentially salt focused uh, regimen, I can create some fucking dank ass shit. I haven't gotten to the point that I want to because it's always a search. It's always a hunt, but I can get there someday. And you can't do that. I, I couldn't replicate a distillery, but I can grow a plant that is every bit as good as a 25-year-old art bag. Do you guys disagree? I think that's what makes cannabis fucking magical, frankly. No, I, I'm right there with you. I'm personally not an alcohol consumer at all. It's just not, it's just not for me. And I find Chocolate, this... Coffee, whatever. But no, I find the same love that you're speaking about or the same love that like a, a connoisseur of whiskey or a connoisseur of brandy or something would would find in that. I find the same thing in cannabis. I just don't find that in alcohol. But the, it's it's the same love. It's just a different it's just Dave. a different product. That's all. So you're just, 
I just need yeah, cigars, dude. Tobacco. Pirate I'm a huge booty. I don't know. Whatever. Yes, yeah, exactly, dude. I, I love cigars. I'm a, I'm a I big cigar. I, I love women, bro. <laughs> I love, you know, I love <laughs> cigars. I, like nice. Stoney and Dix. He's been quiet. Yeah, he's been very quiet. <laughs> but, all right, guys. I think this is probably a good Tyler's spot to, to wrap it up. I agree with you. <laughs> all right. Thanks for coming on, man. Yep. Hey, Thanks well, again, thank Tyler, for, uh, I appreciate for coming it. on. Um, everybody go check out grassrootsfabricpots.com, correct? Yes, it's going to be a while to the concentrated biology stuff and our new living soil pots are on, but you can call us. We'll help you out. Love to help you guys in any way possible. Your success is our success. All right. So there you have it, guys. There's Tyler from Grassroots. Uh, I hope we uh, help you guys learn something tonight. And if you're going to the Indo Expo, make sure you check out Tyler. He'll be there along with uh, most of us, and we will catch y'all next week. Peace out. One love. Peace out. Peace.